thank you for joining Conversations About Abstraction. My name is Lisa Diane Wetchworth, and I am so happy to have you here. This is our last conversation for the series, and it is an honor to share the space with Anna Suhoy, Yanni Min, and Tham Van Tran. And let's get the ball rolling. So this presentation is for educational purposes only. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the Conversations About Abstraction YouTube channel uh, within a few days. The comments, ideas, observations, and analysis of all the work are intellectual property of the participating artists. This presentation may not be copied, published, reused, sold, or distributed in any way without permission from the artists and Conversations About Abstraction. An individual recording of this presentation is prohibited. We thank you all for your patience and understanding. Anna Sue Hoy is a Los Angeles based artist. She utilizes sculpture, installation, and performance to reconnect with the environment, to model and body thought, and to demonstrate the power found in the fleeting and handmade um, and the vulnerable. We are excited to share that she is a recent recipient of the 2021 Anonymous was a Woman Award, and she is the Associate Professor in Ceramics Area Head at the School of Art at the University of California, Los Angeles. Yanni Min is interested in potential spatiality in abstraction, approaching abstraction as an operation as an ongoing process of making new relations and connections among elements rather than as an aesthetic style. In her painting, she explores color techniques, both in terms of pictorial conventions and material application and the actual working conditions to generate unexpected outcomes and new spatial effects. She is also a professor of art at UC Irvine, correct, Yenny? Uh, Riverside. 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 <laughs> And Tham Van Tran works with materials that jog his memories and reflect his experiences. He makes abstract mixed media collages and sculptures dense with textured layers. His works range from large scale canvases covered with thick accretions of found and natural materials to richly colored ceramic and glass sculptures. Everything he uses has personal significance from um, porcelain and clay that signify ceramic jars in which his mother fermented fish sauce sauce to copper leaf and palm fronds that recall the palm trees of his native Vietnam and his adopted Los Angeles. If you would all give me a round, help me in a round of applause, even if it's silent or you can use your, you know, back in the, the poetry days, your snaps to welcome uh, these three wonderful artists. So Anna, Yenny, and Thumb, first of all, welcome. How are you all doing on this rainy afternoon? at the end of 2021. Doing okay, still here. <laughs> yeah. Tom, feel free to unmute yourself. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. Tom, you're muted. Oh, okay. There yeah, we go. No, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm, I'm loving the, the, the weather. So very appreciative yes. of all the rain actually. I am too, I love the rain. It's one of my favorite times of the year, the rainy season, when, when we get it in Southern California. Yeah. yeah. The so, sound of it is really soothing. I'm enjoying isn't it. it? Myself. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having us here. Of course. Thank you. Yes. All right. So let's just start the conversation off with abstraction. This is why we're here. We're having this conversation about abstraction. What is your affinity for abstraction? What is your attraction to it? Why is this language important to you in your practice? important to you in saying what you want to say, address what you want to address? Um, I could, I guess I can start. Um, I, one thing that comes to mind as you're asking that question, Lisa, is that um, there's things that I've always wanted to say um, that I couldn't find the words to say just growing up. I really have a strong memory of trying to express something that I, was really difficult to express. I didn't have the words for it. And um, working in this way, um, building these shapes that I, 
you know, come from me and don't come from outside. It's like a way to give a uh, form to those things that I had wanted to say that didn't have the words. Mm -hmm. So it's like a um, sort of beyond language. And also it can come from um, inside of me and not having to use um, things that I learned from outside. Well, uh, <clears throat> maybe I can sort of pick up on that. I think um, I can certainly relate to that, uh, what Anna just said. Um, and that I think that there was, there's this sort of sense of openness and um, a sense of sort of freedom in quotes, quotes if you will, um, that it's, it's, it seemed to me um, uh, as a kind of an open abstraction, as a kind of an open pro uh, proposition of, you know, um, aesthetic uh, relationships, um, whether with color, forms, scale, surface, um, and and what have you, um, and that seemed to me. Um, freeing um it it seemed to allow for more possibilities i mean at the same time i i am not sure if i've actually sort of decided at one point to say i am not sure if it's a it was a, a sort of a definitive decision um there was another aspect for me that i felt much more um there was a natural relationship uh to me um, to work within this um, realm of abstraction for, for what it's worth. Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's really related to the way my brain works. And um, I just, I've never had, it has to do, I think with like, I'm just the kind of person that will, if I have a manual, I won't read the manual in regards to machine. I'll just like try to figure out the machine, you know, first. So it's has, and that has something to do with being, you know, when you're reading a manual, for example, if there's a, you're reading a description. So I think for me, I just kind of like to, I'm, my mind doesn't work that way in a sense. I've never sort of been really capable of learning, you know, in, you know, approaching machines in a kind of, you know, in a way that's like uh, rational in a sense, or uh, I guess like when you're reading a manual, it's a, you're reading description. So I think for me, I'm more interested in a certain kind of, um, you know, just instead of sort of like approaching things and describing things, which is figuration, I prefer just kind of reflect on a sense of my, you know, phenomena mm -hmm. and sort of like the reverie aspect of, you know, the reflection, the contemplation of, you know, just the moment, the sort of magical moments or not, uh, even it could be a board, a board moment, but describing, you know, the relationship to, you know, what I'm experiencing, you know, uh, day to day, and then just sort of trying to squeeze a sense, an essence out of those uh, relationships to the outside world. So Anna mentioned um, using abstraction um, to you, you refer to it as, you know, inside versus outside, not informed by things outside of yourself. Um, Tham, you mentioned how your brain works and uh, Yeni mentioned kind of this relationship. I'm curious since all three of you were born outside of the United States, New Zealand, Korea, Vietnam, how much of that also, uh, the sights, smells, tastes, the things that you've heard, uh, your culture, um, in addition to now American culture, how much of that informs your practice? How much of that has given you a certain sensibility to the language of abstraction? Well, um, I, I don't think I can say that there's a, a direct relationship um, that, um, that is intelligible uh, in in my work, um, but I do remember the some aspects of you know initial first impression when I arrived here in 1975. 
Um, and, you know, and so I think, I mean, I, I, what I would sort of how I would think about it for me is that whatever that experience, which is also, also kind of an abstract experience, even mm-hmm. though it was such a real dis, um, displacement, um, is that, that all these um, experiences and senses and uh, become, become part of you. Um, and so I, I always like to just sort of think of it as um, that is part of who I am. Um, and, and wherever they are in me, uh, it, it sort of speaks through in the work. So it's, it's not necessarily a kind of a one to one kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's where abstraction is, um, as a process, as you know, I, I say, it's a kind of an operation is really, um, what's the word kind of generous and um and um and 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 th- that, that there's a great potential there um and that it it gives way to individuation and um experience um rather than um you know a, a kind of a fixed meaning or um or a dominant meaning if you will mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, we were talking about names, right, Yanni, and how you have, like, people know you in different names, pronunciation, and then now I'm correcting you guys, like, just, you know, a few minutes ago, how to pronounce my name properly, whether it's Thumb, whether it's Tam or Tums, Tum, and I think it's interesting because it's, that's, I think those kind of, for me, I don't necessarily think my work as a description of my life experiences, but I would say having come here, in 75, just like Yanni, uh, and the change in the environment and just experiencing new terrestrial, you know, phenomena of like, oh, there's a tomato here, you know? I mean, sort of banal, like you look, I remember being in the Camp Pendleton and saw a tomato plant, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, you know, we have that in Vietnam and so forth. Hmm. So I think those sort of like experiences of, you know, in a certain kind, you could say kind of a trauma of, the, for me, at least, the chaos of, you know, being reintroduced into a sort of a new territory. Uh, I think those play into, and then also having, being an outsider, uh, an alien in a sense, and not looking different, for example. I mean, I grew up in Colorado in a Cherry Creek area, which mostly white, and maybe there were like 15 Asians and 10 Blacks. So you definitely stand out as a sort of like the other alien in a sense. So I think the idea for me, like just my life experience of relating to the landscape, the chaotic landscape, and then also being, you know, not seeing myself in my, you know, the, you know, the communities that a suburb that I grew up in Colorado and so forth. I think that plays into a certain kind of exploration of, you know, feelings of, you know, tension of, you know, relating in the environment and observation and and uh, the chaos that sort of ensues in that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I came to the United States when I was three, so I was pretty young when I came here, but I do have um, really such a strong experience of my home culture being, you know, at home with my parents being so different from uh, the outside culture, the main culture, and and any any experience of my friends going to my friends' houses. There was always their houses seemed really different. My parents still have a New Zealand accent, even though they've been living here since 1979. So that would be is that 50 years now? So they, they really hung on to their, their culture. Um, and I guess it took me a long time to try. Um, I grew up in the 80s, so it was kind of like about assimilating. Um, so my parents wanted me to learn English. And even though Chinese was my first language, um, I kind of for, was allowed to forget Chinese in order to learn English. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So it's been a long journey to learn how to value difference and the things that are supposed to, that are strange and the things that are maybe rare. But I think in my work, um, I definitely tr try to, to make sh things that are on the edge of like being ugly or outside <clears throat> of what you would want to look at and like try to bring those things back into something that you cannot look away from. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I, that, that I do a, work on a lot in the studio. Let's talk about set notions since we have this here. Um, as you talk about things on the edge and, and I guess as we talk about set notions, maybe I'd like to kind of move into talking about materials Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you know, I know that you use a lot of clay. If we could talk about materials, um, your relationship to clay, um, paper, um, paint, whatever it is that some of you predominantly use, and how you address some of these ideas and themes and feelings into the work. Um, it it's funny because I I am the I'm head of ceramics at UCLA and I do use a lot of clay in my work I guess but a lot of the images that we are going to be looking at of my work today don't have any clay in them so this, this image here there's no oh, clay. sorry that's okay but we could I mean uh but set notions is also interesting I think be, to talk about right now because it's um it's a site-specific work in upstate New York at this um park art park called Art Omai. Oh and um, when I was walking around the around Omai oh looking for a place to that I wanted to um, make a work, I found this place right here, which is sort of this pathway through a meadow approaching the forest. So um, I love this spot right here because it's kind of it's a transition place where um, the, the meadow ends and the forest begins. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to make a, a, a work that marks that transition. So you can see here, these are really tall powders, powder coated steel um, rings that kind of make a sort of an archway um, in that transition space. Um, they're kind of like a bubble wand that you would blow through when you're blowing mm -hmm. bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, and they have this, um, the fuchsia is a satin tube of, uh, a satin tube. So it's a, a fabric, a very skinny fabric tube about the diameter of the steel tube. So I'm kind of working with a contrast of soft and hard here. Mm -hmm. um, and the different ways that the different the steel and the satin can make a curve. Um, and also the bubble wands kind of become um, viewing windows. Well, I'm glad <clears throat> you said that because I'm, I'm looking at this lower one and it also reminds me, guess remind, I, I don't know your ages, I'm 52. Yes, I don't have a problem saying my age, but it reminds me kind of also of the romper room a mirror. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Romper Room. There was this um, preschool show where the host um, had this mirror and she would look through it. You could see her face. Clearly there wasn't any glass. And she'd say, you know, I see. And you always waited for her to say your name. So you're watching the show and she'll have it and she'll say, well, I see, you know, Michael and Johnny and Susie and Anna. And you're like, yeah, you know, she sees me. And it reminds me of this. And it becomes this focusing device also, this little window, right? I'm looking directly here. And even though I see the, the end of the meadow and the beginning of the forest, I see this, you know, these leaves, this um, tree trunk, this really thin one that kind of moves in a diagonal. And I found myself, even though I'm looking at this entire forest, really drawn to this lower circle here that I think is wonderful. And um, I'd love for you to continue talking a bit about contrast because you have the powder coated steel, you have the satin, you have straight lines and curved lines, you have man-made and organic. Can you talk to us a little bit also about your thinking process and how um, 
how much of that was conscious and some of the choices that you made? Um, I, I'm a great believer in the foil. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm a great believer in, in order to understand something, you have to look at its opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really how I get a lot of energy in the studio by kind of putting opposite things together and seeing whatever that the energy that sparks from that. Um, and if I want to feature something, if I really want to pull out something, a color or a texture or a shape, mm -hmm. um, I, a, a, a strategy that I use a lot is by, is to um, introduce its opposite or a foil for that thing. Mm -hmm. I can really feel soft if I have hard as well. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Um, I want, I'd like Yenny and Thum to respond to material and contrast um, in their work as well. But when you just talked about that, I'd love to go here, um, Anna, and talk about the kind of these contrasts and you addressing that here. Um, we can't see it here, oh, maybe here. We know that, you know, you have these, and I, we don't have a material here. So what are the animals made out of? Um, so this is, this is um, site-specific work that took place in Galleta Meadows in the um, Anza Borrego Desert mm -hmm. um, as part of a festival called Candlewood Arts Festival. And um, these, this Galleta Meadows has a, over a hundred of these metal sculptures of animals that were made by Ricardo Braceda over 15 years. And so there's over a hundred of these ginormous uh, metal animals in the desert landscape. And it's very dramatic and it's a huge crowd pleaser. So people who visit the Anza Borrego desert stop here to enjoy all of the animals and it's a big photo op and people love them. And um, I was wondering when I was invited to make a work here, what I could possibly do to compete with the desert. I mean, because whatever you do art-wise in a desert, it's always like a drop in the ocean, right? It's like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't compete with the landscape. So um, I thought, well, first I can introduce a color that is very, very bright so people can at least see it. Um, and then um, I thought that the Braceda sculptures are the most interesting, one of the most interesting things there. So I thought I would work with those. And um, this one, I made three of these pieces and this one's my favorite. Um, I, basically I, I wrapped three Braceda sculptures with um, hundreds of yards of polyester satin, fuchsia satin. And um, this is, this sculpture was a saber-toothed tiger attacking a wild horse. Mm. Um, and I think this one's the most successful because by wrapping it, I created this thing that the other ones, you could still tell what the animal was that was underneath. And this one, it just transformed it um the uh, Braceda sculpture the most and um so that's why this one is my favorite um and these works are really kinetic and they have a lot of audio as well like the that my experience of being in the desert um is always an experience of wind you know because <laughs> there's nothing to stop the wind it's always right. so windy um so the 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 satin is flapping and always moving um and the the kind of glimmer of the satin also with the bright sun hitting it. So it's, it's very glimmery as well. Yeah, it really does because, you know, I wouldn't know what the two animals were just by looking, but I thought it was some hybrid creature because I could see the hooves and then the claws, you know? So you really did create this new creature, you know, really interesting. Um, I'd love for, let's go to Uni's work. Um, is there anyone in particular? I'm gonna just choose a fabulous one. So I was just going to comment on um, these pieces that the the colors, even though you know these are the the fuchsia color is of course you know um, 
part, you know, color that you can find in nature and in flora. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but it really kind of, um, yeah, the contrast is a good description, it really sort of stands out against the, the sort of neutral, um, especially the desert um, mm -hmm. landscape, um, you know, uh, vegetation and, and, and coloring here. It also feminizes the the rusted steel sort of masculine, Ooh. you know, animals that's been welded by a man, mm -hmm. just wrapping it in this, you know, in the in that shiny fabric and the color also. There's a sort of a there's a feminine, you know, touch sort of a a wand. You touch it, you know, and then sort of making it softer. So it's a nice contrast that softness in relation to the harshness and the you know hardness and of the steel mm -hmm. and the, the heat and the landscape. Mm -hmm. Is it like a prom dress, this fabric? It's like the Met Ball. That's why I think it's like you <laughs> yeah. told me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anna went to yeah. it. She's very, very happy with this piece. And, yeah, it's more sort of a cocktail, <laughs> yeah, gown. Yeah. Yeah, it's very gown like, yeah. I mean, I I guess I'm, you know, just to like, because I'm, you know, when I paint, I think about fabric. Mm. And um, when I make the three-dimensional paintings, the radiance of awareness, those two pieces, they're three-dimensional paintings that then I uh, do, I insert those white um, inserts. So mm -hmm. they create a three-dimensional. So I think a lot of times actually I've sort of, I think a lot about clothing in many ways, not just sort of the decorative aspect of it, but in relation, for example, you know, when we talk, when we, you know, like, for example, Yeni, and I'm sure like people that come here in kind of political uh, circumstances, if you were to flee your country, I'm just thinking about the Afghans who fled recently, what would you bring, right? So you would bring your best in a sense. And so you bring your best clothing. So I think that's always sort of like in the background that the fabric, the, the cloth is a certain kind of you know uh, an armor that we wear to show or in a sense to give us you know a confidence and a presentation a way to magnetize others so we wouldn't be bringing our rags in a sense we would bring be bringing our best and I remember when I fled Vietnam it was that like very specifically we, we brought like the best clothing I mean just the few garments you know um, so I I, you know, so I think like, even like if you, you know, go from these, um, the radiance of awareness into the zipper pieces, there's still, um, so these have, if you look on the far right, there's a line far right, and that's a zipper. So I think for me, it's somehow just making a painting and then having a relationship to a real world object really helps me to connect in a way, it kind of opens the door for me to go deeper into the abstract spaces of what I'm trying to describe. I think from, for me personally, when from the radiance of awareness to these, the radiance of awareness were more about forest, uh, dimly lit forest. And these, they, it's basically the landscape is flooded by uh, water. Mm -hmm. So in these, picture, these particular pieces, I'm exploring just the, the union of the water and the land element and you know I could say like where did that come from and I think having grown up in Da Nang the village in the Da Nang and living very near the sea there was always the danger of um, you know bombs floating onto the sea people throwing grenades into the sea to fish and so there's always been this sort of like oh you know you have the safety of the land but then when you enter the water, there's just this deep, you know, unknown. Mm -hmm. And um, and I explore that from these into the more recent uh, ceramics, which are basically seascapes. Uh, and I think that had a lot to do also during the COVID, you know, all the, the gym was open. So I bought a wetsuit and I started swimming in the ocean, uh, lap swimming, not lap swimming, you know, like just, not just for recreation, but just swimming for exercise. And I think it has, you know, being out in the ocean um, has really influenced the new body of work that I've um, been making in the ceramics. 
Um, but, you have uh, a few ceramics that I'd love to show. Is there one in particular um, that you should well, this, work? Yeah, this piece, again, I think I, these are called punch pots. And so these are, the whole is from just, you know, the force of the fist punching. And so I think it's, you know, the abstraction is just basically, for me personally, of describing certain forces, you know, like, you know, when you talk, like, for example, Richard Serry talks about stacks and, you know, um, the grid and so forth. But, um, it, you know, so I, I think that the punch is obviously there's a violence to it, but it also at the same time magically creates a cat cave. Mm -hmm. And from the from the hole, it, you know, it, it inspired me to think of the idea of the cave and being underwater and the fishes swimming in the cave. Um, um, well, let's go back for a second because I did I wanted to show a recent um, ceramic work, but as you I did have a few questions. Um, as you were talking about this work <clears throat> and the zipper pieces in general, um, is the zipper functional? Can one un unzip it if one desired, or is um, it mostly it's, aesthetic as line? Well, you could. Well, you. I didn't put the zipper in there just because structurally, I just I didn't want something hanging. You know, uh, I did think about that when I made it. Like, oh, can you unzip it? So for no, it's not. I mean, you could unzip it. But then there's no device to, you know, and and device to zip it back essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's more just basically it's a line, and the line is an expression. It's you know it's a saying, yeah, in a sense, um, just like any line. And but I think you know when you look at these work, it's if you look at the oh how does it relate to the three dimensional pieces? I think the zipper it goes back to the idea of the cloth as you know. Uh, a, you know, a fabric that keeps us warm, mm -hmm. uh, gives us a sense of who we are, um, a sense of pride, and it's, um, yeah, it's a really important component within everyday life, essentially, mm -hmm. or okay. fashion. You talked to, go ahead. Oh, when I, when I look at this um, artwork, I also think about the zipper and the holes as kind of disruptions in the picture that you've made mm -hmm. yeah well it's interesting because Anna, when you talk about the ugly i you know it's also like within my I, I i like just the you know again the tension of the rawness of um the beauty and and the rawness the ugliness in a sense to sort of be explained sort of like how you know life in a sense right mm -hmm. Uh, the chart, you know, the chaos and the magic. The holes actually are from because I paint those on really thin paper. It rips in the process of you know using a scraper, uh, scrape a knife and so forth. So they they tear while they're the paper's thin and it's wet. It tears into the painting. Mm -hmm. So what then I do with those holes? Then I um, I sort of you know and sort of enhance it and I put paper, uh, silver foil in the back. So it, when it curls, you can see there's a little curling. Mm -hmm. It's actually uh, a showing of the silver foil. And mm -hmm. I think it's, we have, you know, we're both, we have, so we, we move in a, we, we have certain similar ideas in a sense, sort of like to bringing out, you know, punctuating them work so that it comes alive. So there's a contrast of the fluid of the acrylic, but then, you know, the shininess of the silver foil and then the zipper, you know, so it's sort of kind of all coming reflection of, you know, the natural elements in, in nature and then, you know, uh, sort of culture, uh, you know, how with the fabric works and so forth. Did you always embrace the holes that naturally occur in the work? Or did it come um, with time? Well, I mean, if, you know, I mean, clearly the most obvious person that did holes was uh, Lucio Fontana, right? So I would say I really was really magnetized by the violence of the, you know, the cutting of the hole. So mm -hmm. the hole in a way is related to my three-dimensional uh, beetle manifestos, which have, a, they're held together by staples. Mm -hmm. So the holes is a kind of relationship to the, to, so that the staples is kind of like a, 
uh, surgical, uh, you know, like surgical staples. Mm -hmm. And so I think the holes has something to do with, in a sense, a wound, mm -hmm. which is like the hole in that one vase, uh, the, the punch pot. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. and I think there, you know, when, when we talk about abstraction, I guess, yeah, I'm not, you know, obviously, clearly we're not interested. If I wanted to describe something, I'm not, I remember being at Pratt and being, having to take anatomy class. We had a cadaver, went over to Columbia and we had to like draw, you know, sort of Beaux-Arts style, right? Mm -hmm. And I was really, wow. I really, I really dis disliked those classes. <laughs> and I realized like my mind, I'm not interested in describing, you know, a figure. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in describing experiences. And so I think that's where abstraction can provide insight. It provides a way, a way out for us in a sense, mm -hmm. because we don't have to describe, you know, the whole world describes, yeah. right? So we're like basically kind of like swimming in the ocean of sort of, we're interested in abstraction is being interested in the swimming in the ocean of sort of non-conceptuality. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where the root of uh, abstraction is. And it provides for us a, 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 a sense of freedom and escape from, you know, having to explain things because mm -hmm. we're all about explaining. We're, you know, we're pressured to explain, right? Mm -hmm. We're, express, we're pressured to explain, oh, what is the meaning of your work, for example, in a sense. So when you're in the studio, you don't have to, you let go of that. And you're just kind of embracing a certain kind of union with that non-conceptual space mm -hmm. and that silence. And I think that's really where the heart of the abstraction is. It happens in the studio and it's a certain kind of freedom that exists only really when there's silence because the silence is allows you to become in union with that very non-conceptual non-dual space so i think for me you know that's really where the heart of abstraction is it really takes it just really allows us to we don't need to explain <laughs> we just need to express like you know sort of like poetics of life in a sense. So that's an affirmation. I think that's our role as an artist to affirm that beauty to the rest of humanity. So. Well, the conversation is now over. <laughs> he, he wrapped it up. So We're done. We'll, we'll see you in 2020. So what, else can you like, say? Like, what, what else can you say? <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. I mean, yes, I, um, I mean, it's interesting to you know, um, and and in some ways, it's sort of foundational uh, to speak about language and that abstraction, a visual abstraction. You know, it's always sort of pushing up against language and 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 um, or or putting pushing it to the limits of language, and so there's there's because it's never enough right if you, you can try to explain or describe something uh in words and but it's it, it doesn't quite do the job uh you can get close to it you can you can um use words um but it is it is not the thing it's not the thing that you are experiencing um I guess, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, making abstract painting is anything uh, but abstract, <laughs> you know, and returning to this, the studio practice um, is really, um, you know, all in physical material entanglement. Um, and, 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 for me, it always involves some sort of process, and 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 for me also that it involves some notion of seriality, um, in that um, I have to do it a number of times. I have to try a number of times as it evolves, and it it tells me something about what it's becoming what it wants to be, so to speak. And so for that process to, to really um, 
sort of work itself and 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 to be involved in that kind of process uh you know it it it, it produces a certain sense of seriality for me um i guess the other thing that i would say is color um and i've always thought that there was or there is a sort of kind of a direct correlation um, to abstraction um, in terms of what we perceive um, color is. And because color is fundamentally plural, it's fundamentally um, unstable. And it's, um, you know, every time we look at something and, and perceive um, and experience color, it's, you know, it's it's um, it's kind of an epic event. I mean, we don't stop to think about it really or consider it. But uh, for that that um, interaction um, to to register, there's so many moving parts to it. Right? Are the light hitting the surface and and the reflection and our own eyeballs perceiving it and you know our own eyeballs aren't exactly flat there it's it's a rounded surface and so there's distortions and so all these things to kind of jive in a sense and and register as an experience of color is you know phenomenal um and also in that it it's constantly changing. It's it's always about, um, in a sense, about movement and uh, uncertainty. Um, so um, that in itself is um, fascinating to me, and it's um, important to me to think about um, in my work. And. I guess the other thing I would say about color is that you always, you know, we experience color in relationship to other things. We, we don't, you know, we're not experiencing color in some pure uh, situation. It's that's impossible. So it's always in relation to uh, the world um, and its environment. And, 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 and in, to that extent, it's, it's always, um, you know, a kind of a moving target, right? It's um, and ephemeral um, in that sense. So um, it's it's important for me to uh, in 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 the work to to um, explore this realm of color um, and. Um, and this work that you're uh, showing is um, an example from the most recent um, exhibition I had in July this year. Hey, Yanni, and... I, I, I took some notes on this work because I came to the opening and spent some time. <laughs> can, I, can I read? Really? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear that. I mean, yeah. first, first, the two words that uh, pop into my head when I see these or think about these is um, joy and bravado. Yeah. Um, and I said, I, I wrote um, the bravado of that, that every move is visible from the first to the last. The standing pieces can be viewed from either side and there's a literal transparency of gesture. Um, and the bright colors are joyous. And also the gesture, the, the scale of the gesture is so large relative to the, the picture plane. Thank you. Thank you for taking notes, <laughs> taking notes <laughs> at my opening. That's, uh, that's more than I can ask um, anyone. That's uh, very sweet. Um, you know, these were, um, I, I worked with glass and wet paint, which are two things that don't necessarily go, um, you know, go well. Um, they're, they're not the most hospitable company. And so um, 
in this work, it was, I mean, I was making paintings on glass with paint pouring, spilling, dripping, and different kinds of gestures. But it was also at the same time, um, sort of letting go of what I could control. Um, and, um, and in that sense, it was a bit of a, like a chemistry experiment um, because things would take, colors would take uh, time to, to solidify and, and, and move towards some, some sense of stability. And so I ha literally, you know, wouldn't really be able to see the gesture that I just made um, until the, the day after or some hours after. Mm -hmm. So um, this kind of delay in being able to see what happened um, was, you know, um, it provided a certain sense of time um, to both be able to make certain decisions and not think about it. Uh, not be able to judge it right away. Um, so it, this kind of delay intervals um, um, was, there was a certain kind of flexibility and um, freedom there um, as well in the process. Yeah. I, I, and I had the same thought too when I was looking at you know, these, these paintings. I, I saw, saw the show as well, but there's this, there is, because I've been thinking about joy, you know, and obviously like when you, I was like, Matisse is sort of the ultimate person in that way. And he talks yeah. about that. He talks about just, you know, we really want to just make work about beauty and make people happy. And not in those words, but I, you know, he's talked about that. And I think, I think about that too. Oh, you know, when I look at your work, Yanni, there's a sense, it's like you, I wonder what you think about that because your color, beautiful color choices, but then there also is just, you know, chaos happening. And like, oh, I'm comfortable with the with the chaos. I'm uncomfortable. I'm comfortable with the irregular shapes that is determined by the way I, uh, you know, hold the painting, whether it's vertical or sideways and so forth. So you're basically coming up. You're allowing the drifts to create new forms. So I was wondering that because I think about joy and because in my work. Oh no, froze a little. <clears throat> yeah, being comfortable with the allowing yourself to express joy through the color, but also there's a certain kind of being relaxed about the the imperfections of the drips. So I was just wondering whether you think about that. I mean, whether joy plays like, the idea of that because it's really a complex, you know, it's an existential essentially um, reflection in a sense, like allowing yourself, allowing your work to have joy in it which determines the colors right it's like oh the flowers i'm just you know what do you know what i mean like rather than anxiety so yeah um yeah no thanks for the question um i would say that the the process of making a uh, painting is um complex <laughs> and um i I love that the, the paintings in the end, uh, when it's finished or in its finished state, um, can provide or, or, or um, engender that sense of uh, joy or pleasure. Um, and I think about the pleasure of making very seriously. Um, but it's not, it's a pleasure, not in the sense that I'm always just you know, sort of happy making them. Um, you know, that pleasure encompasses a whole range of emotions and, um, you know, from initial exuberance and excitement to, you know, uh, you know, um, discomfort um, or um, cringing <laughs> and, and, and the kind of trauma of not having to or not being able to sort of know what to do. I mean, all those um, aspects of making um, 
I want them to be gone when 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 the work is done, and I I don't want the work to I wouldn't work want the work to bear that um, in a sense, you know. Um, so, but but the the process of making is um, is uh, it, it covers a whole range of of uh, feelings and um, judgments along the way. Um, but I always sort of think of color um, as doing the most, doing the hardest work um, right. in the end. Um, and so um, that's co both comforting and, uh, um, and um, the enormous range of color is, um, you know, it's daunting to even think about, uh, yeah, you know, totally. um, and, um, and, you know, good in a good way. Yeah. Yuli, are these made on a single pane of glass or two that are yeah. in a single? So the wall pieces are uh, a single panel, mm -hmm. single pane of glass. I, I use these um, glass called Starfire um, tempered glass. The Starfire glass are, are, are clear uh, and they don't have, or they have very little of that sort of green tint that mm -hmm. in glass. So it's, it's pretty clear. And the floor pieces have, um, two panes of glass paintings um, that are uh, spaced out uh, about an inch in between. So, so, um, and they're, um, so they're, they're kind of back to back and, and you would have to walk around mm -hmm. to be able to see both sides, but you can never see both sides at any given time in a, uh, simultaneously. And so the idea of composition um, is difficult to manage here. It's not, it's not a sort of a, uh, um, uh, an instant, mm -hmm. but rather it involves time um, to, to travel to the other side, to be able mm -hmm. to, um, to remember. Um, and um, there are certain open areas where, it, where you can see through. So, um, through the the context or the the uh, this, the space uh, that the work is in. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things. So <clears throat> I asked because I do appreciate. Um, <clears throat> I haven't seen them in person. I would love to one day. But I also appreciate the shadow that's created. And you can see it here uh, between the white and orange shapes and that white pe the white shape. You can kind of see this cast shadow, which I think also then creates its own lines, right? This own shape and gives a sense of depth. I'm curious in your observations of people viewing your work and this idea of traveling to each side in time, how do, is, that must be something really interesting to observe, seeing how people engage. Because I'm thinking, I'm picturing myself looking at one side, walking to the other, trying to remember that shape and kind of engaging with it, moving back and forth. Do you see people engaging with the work in that way? Yeah, I think the floor piece um, is it's it sort of asks for that. Um, so um, I, I yeah I, I do um, have seen people walk around and uh, and thank you for bringing up the shadow because um, that is an important part of the the effect of painting on glass in the first place. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I forgot to mention that, but um, but that 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 it becomes. Um, it becomes part of the not, not only the composition, but but the effect of light, mm -hmm. and um, you can also see that on the on the wall pieces that mm -hmm. it it projects onto the wall uh, surface, and um, and the whole thing sort of I mean you know many things led to this work, but um, I was thinking of you know the the show this group of work is titled titled Vitreous Opacities. And um, in what it is, it's, it's actually a medical condition in your eye. Mm -hmm. um, the vitreous body of the eye is the kind of, that kind of gel-like substance behind the lens of, of your eye. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out that it is in fact, that, that 
gel-like substance that makes seeing possible. And when you have, maybe you've experienced this, some people have, some people haven't, but if, if there's something in there, then you can, you can when you, um, it, it, it kind of flutters. Um, and so people have experienced this condition mm -hmm. And, um, and that interests me. Uh, and, and, and I thought there was a kind of interesting relationship to the clear, you know, ness of the glass itself. And so I was um, kind of making a uh, um, thinking, thinking and, and connecting to um, our own physiology of, of seeing um, with this work. I have a question for all three of you about titles and um... Um, kind of as a way to allow viewers to enter the work. Um, Tham, you talked about the freedom in abstraction and uh, not having a need to describe everything. And um, she said, there was something Uni said, oh, um, taking the work or being at this edge of language. And are titles really important to you? Um, clearly in this sense, right, there's this relationship. Um, some of the work that we have here are untitled works. How important in your freedom, the lack of a need to be descriptive and being at the edge of language are your titles? Does this become a really important part of the work? Would any of you be satisfied to make work and have them always be untitled? There are a couple questions there. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, for me, um, it depends, you know, sometimes I, I mean, for example, some of the ceramics I'm talking about, basically family relationship, you know, this one, I think is called, what is this one living with you or living yes. without you? This is living and with you. And it's just basically the idea of a sense of a fish tank and the certain kind of power, power if you, you know, and the various sentient beings within the fish tank, the fishes, and that's a kind of reflection of relationships within a family dynamic in a sense, or even, you know, community dynamic. So the fishes are kind of representation of this kind of, I was thinking the idea of a fish tank, even though it's oceanic and it's seascape, that uh, living with you, I think the other one is living without you, um, this one is living without you, right? I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, my thing is so, but you know, this it's, um, yeah. So it's just the sort of, you know, the things that happen between interpersonal, you know, family dynamics and um, friendships, relationships, work and so forth. Um, but it's not really about just sort of, you know, particular, it's not particularly happening within, you know, a room it's like you know in this instance it's happening out in the vast ocean um and i think i in the brick piece of the right so that is this is called family unit and um there's clearly uh a, you know a, a head figure sort of in sense sort of like you could say a guardian or a father or female figure i mean maybe there's sort of like a you know uh, yeah, so, and then the vases are sort of, in a sense, um, little babies, you know, oh, with, of that previous brick piece. So that's, the previous oh. piece was, uh, yeah, so <laughs> that piece is glazed bottles with the figure, the alien figure, and then on top of three glazed bricks. And I think for me, like the glazed bricks is just the idea of just transforming something uh, about the brick is a kind of a manual aspect to, you know, uh, when you're making bricks, when you're laying bricks, there's a manual aspect and clearly it denotes a certain kind of class, right? Uh, labor. And so just transform, transforming that into a certain kind of architectural support, a house that supports, you know, the family. Um, so I, as you know, going back to your question, I do, I do intentionally, I want to, have a certain kind of read on the piece and mm -hmm. giving a title helps with that. Mm -hmm. It helps point the way for the, the audience. Yeah. For the... There's this association now, this way of right. entering the piece and understanding, right? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I would um, say the same. I mean, whenever possible, I I would like I, I try to title the work. Um, and it's it's a bit of an information. It's a bit of entryway into the work, and um, you know. But sometimes, um, for instance, this one I, I called it untitled, but then in the parentheses, it didn't really come to me. Sometimes titles just sort of come, and you know that's the title for the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, other times, it's like it doesn't and <laughs> it's very painful um but this is um this is a title of a song in the same room that i um music that i was listening to a lot um you know um at this particular time and so that's the way i titled it sometimes my titles are more matter of fact um you know um in for instance the Hammer Project, um, it describes actually something about the way I actually made the work. And it was about kind of seeing, um, well, I mean, the work that I made for this um, site project, considering the history of the site of this, um, you know, space as, a, as an exhibition space uh, at the museum, um, I wanted to deal with the floor um, where you would have to physically kind of readjust your orientation of looking at a work of art. And um, so I made the work on glass actually at a 1% scale. And knowing that it, it's going, it was going to be uh, projected at a hundred times, which was difficult to get my head around. Um, and after I made the work, I had to um, get it, you know, I had to uh, document it. And um, it was an interesting experience of, of, of trying to see something so, um, something, trying to record uh, information of, at a 1% scale uh, for this projection meant that you had to be so close to the surface of the work which human eye just can't do. And so, I mean, of course I used a camera, but it was interesting to think about camera as a kind of objective mechanical device. Uh, and this is exactly the way I used it for, for this project, which was then you know, blown up hundred times and printed onto a vinyl uh, floor material. But sorry, uh, but the, the question about title, this one is called Up Close in Distance. Mm -hmm. Um, and the bars uh, point to the bars on the side of the steps there and the flags, those little triangular areas seem like flags to me. Um, and the pools describe, uh, in my mind, the pools of color. Um, so um, that's how that title came, came up. So it sort of depends for me too, as, as Tam um, said for his work. I would just add that um, when you title something, it, in order to title something, you kind of have to have a little bit of distance from the thing, because it means that you're stepping back and looking at it and understand, coming to some kind of understanding of it. Um, and it just made me think about um, when I, naming my children, like they start as part of me and then um when i can start to conceive of it them the children or the art artwork as something outside of me or something that can stand on its own then i can think about giving it a name mm -hmm. that's interesting it's yeah and i was just curious about your work actually because there seems you know yanni your work is to me is just in a kind of like the purest like the most abstract in a sense of all of between the three of us because in my work and also in anna's work i see signs of intelligence like signs of sentient intelligence because there's a figure there's sort of a figure kind of looming in the background in anna's work whether it's sort of like the two sort of 
I think in I, like they look almost like eyes or something. So there's always there's a there's a sign of sentient intelligence. So I just you know whereas Yoni, I don't see that kind of figuration. It's you know pure kind of just you know abstraction in a sense. So I'm just wondering whether in your work that you draw that out obviously because I that's what I see. But I was just curious about from your point of view, um, what you what what you're thinking and. Um, I think a lot about symmetry and asymmetry um, and the symmetry of the body or of the face, really. So, yeah, I think about um, when I, I deal with material, with clay, with metal. And so, like, I'm moving these things around in my studio. And as I'm moving things around, it does feel like performance or choreography, you know, like the, how, how Yenny was talking about seriality in making, how uh, she has to create thing, a, a series of work to understand what she's making. It's like, in order for me to make my sculptures, I also work in series, but it becomes a series of moves or a series of gestures mm -hmm. that I have to understand through repetition in mm -hmm. order to make the work. But then that brings the body in. Yeah. So, and also like, so, so yeah, the body is in there always. And also like, in order to look at a sculpture, like you have to walk around it. So then the body is always, I mean, the body is always looming a, a figure. I guess it, I call it the body. Maybe you, you can call it a figure. Um, and then, um, what I want to see is kind of like, it probably is, is I, when I'm, when I'm making these kind of forms like that orb form that we're looking at that's draped in leather, it's almost like um, I think about what it is like to have a body and I want to express or explore that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, a lot of that kind of thinking um, it, in my sculptures about like inside and outside. So this piece, Veiled Orb, the, it's, un, it's unglazed on the outside, but the glaze is on the inside. And that was a way for me to um, direct our attention to the inside of the work. It's like a piece that I made by, um, uh, partially by carving. Um, and so it was really carving from the inside. So, um, I thought, you know, the piece that was on the wall with the green extrusion, that's a really interesting piece. That one, if you go back one more slide, I think this this wall, uh, yeah. So that's yeah. a very, it's, I guess I, when I think about just sort of like, you know, minimalist male sculptors, you know, how they were kind of like laying out the bricks or stacking things or, you know, it's, I haven't in a sense, I guess, what's her name? Um, the one that did the, Robert Morris's uh, ex who did the photo with herself with the penis. What's her name? Linda. Linda uh, Banklis. Right. So I guess this piece kind of relates the most in a sense to that, you know, that heritage of minimal sculpture, because this, you could say it's the body, but it's also, you could say it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's a gesture that you don't see often of the, per, of sort of like, you know, a mushed up, you know, but uh, uh, mush up organic matters being squeezed out in a sense, you know, whether it's like the end tip of uh, a cake decoration where you're squeezing out whipped cream, right? Mm. Frosting or else obviously this is very, you know, the body or even a sausage, you know, like when you're making sausages. So it's, um, I guess, yeah. Can I do a performance for you right now? Uh, <laughs> sure. See this? Yeah. Interesting. Ah. Mm. Uh. Ah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, got earbuds with this it, piece, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, I was also thinking um, that there's there's both kind of. Uh, it's interesting to hear uh, uh, Thumb talk about the minimalist because I was thinking about your cinder blocks, the way you use you cinder blocks as base, and you know I was sort of think that that's a kind of a 
I don't know, a nod or a middle finger to the minimalism um, in, in, in your work, but they're, they just are purely kind of functional, often the way you use them as a base. Uh, but, um, but what I was thinking was that um, there's often both, I also think of your, some of your forms as sort of bodies or body, very bodily, and that there is a kind of, um, a, in different pieces, a, a, a kind of humor, um, as well as a kind of erotic charge in some of them, um, kind of coexisting. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, um, and, and the piece that uh, we were just seeing with the thing gushing out, um, you know, it's, it's like, there's a lot of different kinds of uh, sensation here going on, you know, totally. from this, this piece and, and, uh, and the symmetry is, is a, is a kind of a structure, like gives you a kind of sense of organization, you know, um, yet, um, we're looking at this form that, um, feels a little bit funny too, uh, and, and maybe even erotic, you know, uh, and then this kind of nuclear green stuff just oozing out. Yeah. So, um, and um, the title here also, uh, the reference to the kid, cheeky kid, um, also adds to the flavor of yeah. this, this work. And, and I was just, uh, yeah, so I was curious about what you think of that. Um, well, just to add, I was, the reason why I bring up minimalism, because I think Anno had worked for Jackie Windsor, right? And she basically built like a, a bomb, like a minimalist cube bomb, because all of them have their, you know, when you look at her, Jackie's work, and Anna, I think you work for her, there's a sense of like, it's just going to combust in a sense. So I guess I'm thinking in relation to, you know, your heritage in a sense, sculptural heritage and, you know, who you're, uh, who you study with and associate and hung out with, you know, I guess there's, I'm linking that um, gesture to just previous, you know, male, male mess sculptures and, you know, so. And I think Jackie obviously has probably influenced you early on in a sense, like she's part of your, you know, your, 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 your universe in a sense uh, early on. So, um, yeah. That's very true. I mean, Jackie is such an um, <laughs> interesting person to have. I mean, I'm, I'm so lucky that I, I got to meet her so young. I think I was 21 when I started working for Jackie. Um, just the muscularity of what she was doing and also or, order, bringing order to all of these disorderly things like trees and big piles of rope. Um, the thing that I think my work has though, after I looked at Jackie's work is that I'm from LA and I am a kid of the 80s and 90s. So I used to wear, I treasured my fluorescent pink and fluorescent yellow sweatshirts and my slouchy socks and, um, like there's a, there's minimalism maybe taught me bones and structure, but then I, I also, my, another artist who I, who I love, who doesn't even consider themselves to be an artist is um, Ray Kawakubo, who um, makes clothes under the name Comme des Garçons. Um, yeah. Just the way that, Ray Kawakubo can mess like she she kind of reveres the body by making clothing things that go on the body but she also messes with it by making clothes that like have giant tumors on them so when you put the clothes on your body's totally distorted yeah yeah no she's amazing yeah I agree 
Well, you guys, I, I have quite a few questions, but we are at 2.20 and I would like to open it up. And this has been really fabulous. I, we could go on and on, but I would like to see if there's anyone in the audience that has a direct question for either of the artists or all three of them. Uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself or you can send a message in the chat and um, we can read it out loud. Is there anyone in the audience that has a question? While we're waiting, um, you talked earlier about seriality and kind of this repetition of making more than one. Uni, you started that. I'm curious as to when you know or feel that a series is complete. Um, does the work tell you in a sense, uh, you said all that you want or need to say? And Anna, you mentioned kind of this repetition, the seriality and gesture. And when do you know that that gesture has been completed or exhausted? Well, um, I want to say that um, it, it, it seems to have its natural life. Uh, I, I'm not you know, giving you a concrete answer, but, um, and, and I would also add to that, that um, things happen along the way. Yeah. Um, and, and usually it, there's there's some sort of kind of uh, what feels like a a completion or a break maybe a break is a better mm -hmm. term um, and um, and it needs a pause of some kind and then um, and then uh, something else can start or or there's a a start of something else but what I find I think over the years is that there's a way in which that, um, in, uh, where uh, you know, things seep through between different groups or different series of works. So sometimes it feels like, oh, it's the same problem, you know, all over again. Um, and it's, it's taking on, it's manifesting um, itself in a different way. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'd have to, I, I would sort of um, impose uh, a different conditions, you know, to as a, as a kind of a setup. So I might introduce a different tool uh, that I haven't used before. I mean, I've used sprayers and squeegees and, you know, um, trowels. And so, so that something like that could introduce a, um, Sort of a new new condition, uh, um, and that would that could start to generate a different, you know, different sort of vocabulary within the work, and um, and 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 it's um, and that can go on, yeah. And you know, there's different 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 as you know, you know, at, at different places within a, a let's say a series of work uh, throughout the production. For sure, yeah. Thank you, Uni. Anna, did you want to respond to that, or we have we also have a question? But I'd love to hear your response. I could just say I could be quick and just say that often um, the reason why I need to repeat things <clears throat> and make things in series, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I um, I have so much failure in my work, like when I'm making a when I'm making something out of clay or a sculpture, um, I'm usually doing something with clay that you're not supposed to do, or I'm trying something that um, I've never done before. So in order to figure out how to do it, I just have to try to do something and then it doesn't work. And so then I have to adjust and try again um, and keep, keep doing something until I I uh, can hit on the thing that, <laughs> that I can keep going with. Mm -hmm. So working with failure um, is something that I do a lot. It's that was it's an interesting because we had talked about just the three of us about abstraction and just like oh maybe people 
it might be insightful, like how to talk about abstraction as like, how do you make an abstraction, you know, in sense as opposed to like, we're, we can be very, we can talk about our process and in some sense, it's sort of philosophical and sort of abstract in a mm-hmm. sense. Uh, and I guess it just reminds me just the, what the two of you just said. I feel like the abstraction, sometimes it's just like in the studio process, you just encounter mistakes and the mistakes yeah. just takes you to like a different degree. Like you turn the corner and, and you didn't expect it. So I think a lot of, for me, I've learned like, you know, it's just like being, I think the mistakes that happen in the, the process of making mm-hmm. and the mistakes that happen in the work, really, it's really, it's, it's sort of like the, you know, it's, it's very helpful. I mean, it's like, it really brings you, that's like, sort of like in a sense, it's, it's, that's where the abstraction in many ways, it's one way of just to enter without like, just turning your intention in a sense, like totally yes. turn your mind upside down since. Well, that, that, I was, that's what I was thinking about um, when I asked you about the holes, because initially when you talked about it, I was interpreting the creation of the holes kind of as an accident, a mistake, since you said the paper was thin and you're scraping in the embracing of that, right? The potentially the embracing of that mistake, right? Yeah. Well, um, go ahead. May I just, may I just add the, the I think, um, I mean, we're calling it a mistake and maybe it is at the time, um, but I think it's also, um, you know, it's always kind of like traumatic. When yeah. Happen, you know, it's like, oh my God. But, you know, um, but at the same time, it's because it's unexpected, you know, yeah. it's somehow you didn't expect that to happen and, and it's kind of shocking and traumatic, but, um, and sometimes it is, sometimes yeah. it's the stuff you have to discard, but other times it just, it needs time. Yeah. Uh, I think it's and look at our last two. Yeah. yeah. I think it it's our, a revelation in, in a sense. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, the mistake, it becomes a revelation. It can become a revelation. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think in our last talk, I referred to it as an unplanned mark making, right? And and I I like your mention of trauma. And I shared this then. (laughs) I remember doing this particular gesture on a canvas. And when I was done and I saw it, I was terrified. I was mortified because I thought I had made this mistake. And yeah. I can be a perfectionist. And someone walked in and was like, that mark. And I was like, hmm. And I embraced this form of mark making that I use now, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, you have to, cons- yeah. I mean, so, so it's like you have to constantly kind of, you know, it, 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 it's asking, it, it's like in front of your face. It's like, it's asking you your own like presumptions and, um, you know, assumptions about, what what you're thinking you know so that's why it's like it, it confronts you um and what, what you believe and, Let's and get this done. You know, your values excuse me somebody, excuse me somebody's um unmuted and yeah i just want to ask this uh, one other thing oh, oh, i'm sorry i thought i found out Peter. this from mac can you, you see guys? If you can see this drive on your computer Peter, you're you're yeah, well, let's you're see what you just look i'll sit here and listen to you. you want me to go <laughs> <laughs> uh, excuse me someone is can you can you mute yourself please the person is talking really you. so what i did for you reference i can't find this person to mute them. oh my god i'm trying yeah. to call him right now um, yeah. yeah but you double click where you downloaded it, it yeah. loads a okay virtual oh peter hard drive. peter I, Oh, I just muted them. Um, oh, that was good. like the Zoom. That was like the Zoom. Oh my God. That, that okay. was Coming just in the room. incredible. <laughs> hey, we're, we're embracing. Peter, I hope you had your clothes on. Lisa, you don't, you don't know this, but Peter is my husband. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, Peter, you are welcome. We just, you know, wanted you to uh, mute yourself. So um, oh um, one quick question about something that I saw that I'm really interested in. And then we're going to, it looks like we have some questions I coming through. I can't soon. hear this anymore. <laughs> um, Anna, you oh, have- What is this? It's, it's people in high school? Or? No, it's like a lecture series. That these people are famous people. Um, Anna, you have time. She got Yanni's calling me right now. <laughs> yeah, because we can hear you talking. You, you need to mute. We just we, you're not muted. We can hear your conversation. Oh, He's muted. Okay. Oh my god. Um, 
Anna, you have time <laughs> listed here under materials. Can you talk about that? Yes. I, I like that you have that there. Um, so this work, Mirror Blob, the dates for this work are 2008 to 2017. Um, so this work uh, I made in 2008 um, and it's made out of a mirror and then cellu clay, which is like a paper mache clay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when the piece came back from the, sh the exhibition it was in, in 08, um, it was in storage for a while. And then when I was cleaning out my storage, I pulled it out and um, put it in my backyard. Um, probably in 2013, 2014, when I used it to make, um, when I cast the work to make it a, a fiberglass copy. Um, so I took this original paper mache clay piece and left it in my backyard um, because my kids liked playing with it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna throw it away sometime. And it just sat there in the sun and it sat there in the rain. Um, and it's kind of disintegrated over the couple years. And um, when I had this exhibition to prepare for um, in 2017, I um, started looking at this piece that I had left in my yard for a couple years. And I thought this piece is actually looking really amazing now. Mm -hmm. It's full of black mold, which is something that nobody really wants to have in their house. <laughs> it's got rain stains and it's cracking, but it just, um, it was like I, uh, the weather did its work on it and time did its work on it mm -hmm. um, and, and changed it. And um, so that's why time is, a, one of, is listed as a media. I love it. I think it's great. Um, okay, so we have a couple of questions. Oh, Car Caroline David um, asked actually the same question. Wonderful. So we have a question here for all three of you. <clears throat> How do you feel your work has furthered the progression of abstraction as a person of color in particular? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, it's, go ahead, Yanni. I was no, no, waiting no, no, for no, you to. I was going to say, you go. <laughs> okay. No, it is a, it, uh, you know, that's, it's one of those questions like, oh, do I think of myself as a person of color or do I think of myself as just an artist who's engaged with the world? Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of like, oh, do I, so I can totally understand, you know, when you don't, like, when you think, when you don't feel like in a certain sense, like I, for me, I guess what my point is that I've had a lot of experiences and one of those crucial experiences coming to this country in 75 as a refugee and it was a political thing and also economic. And I think my encounters in, you know, having come here actually as a refugee, but also without my parents. So I, 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 I grew up with American foster families because my parents were not able to join me and my siblings. So I think I've had a lot of life experiences where I would say have um, influenced what I make now. And it's not necessarily, I'm describing my personal experience, but I'm more encapsulating a certain sense of, you know, pathos, but also magic at the same time. And I think I express it within a certain kind of, you know, I mean, the abstraction allows me to explore that chaos in a sense and, uh, and the fluctuation of, you know, sort of like the fluidity basically of life experiences because the impermanence of life is like, you know, it's not that similar when you're working, for example, when I work in acrylic, I use the acrylic and I add a lot of medium and water. So it's, there's a, there's just, just sort of things that it's a fluid component as opposed to like when you're working with oil or like take acrylic, it's like this sort of like paste, right? So it, you know, working with fluid, it's more of a sort of magnifies just in a sense of my, you know, reflection on just my own experience, you know, having come here and then learning 
to assimilate and that assimilation eases uh, a certain kind of, um, and then also I think, um, I didn't finish the last thought, but I think also just coming here and then studying abstraction in New York, I think I'm very, for me personally, it's like made me very conscious about, in a sense, like, you know, for example, like, you know, I, geometries, for example, you know, when you think about Mandarin, that's like a really very Western language. And in a way, I've always thought of myself as, you know, this little Vietnamese guy and always, you know, studying Western art. And I, so I guess in a way, like myself learning, trying to figure a way out, a figure of like how to, um, I guess the point is that, yes, my work comes from an experience, my experience as a political refugee and also just trying to cohabitate and sense, seeing myself within, you know, a community of mostly white people growing up in Denver. Um, so I don't know if that explains it, but it definitely colors like my, you know, what I make in a sense. Well, I do, I do think it's an interesting question, right? And I think it's an appropriate question. One, it does ask for all of you, do you feel that your work has furthered the progression of abstraction? But um, as non-white people, oftentimes uh, being in the art world, many of us are regulated to, you know, if you're Black, the show in Black History Month. Um, if there's some event that's occurring, um, and it's appropriate, one would, uh, and one deems it appropriate, we're going to have, you know, all the Asian abstract artists. Um, so, you know, this is real. Many people who are non-white have been marginalized or excluded out of the Western canon. So I think the question is, is a, a, um, a relevant one, you know? Um, I think, just to add what you said, I think it's really interesting because that's like basically, you know, making abstract art, we're not, like, I'm not necessarily painting the black Asian body or, you know, oh, no, I, I, think a lot, I think a lot right now, like particularly interest in African-American art is about the black body, which is a very important, you know, com it's an important issue, but, you know, I'm not necessarily painting about the Asian body. Mm -hmm. I'm painting, I'm making work about the, the, my Asian American experience, my Vietnamese, you know, American mm -hmm. experience. So. Let's love to add in here. Um, just what we were talking about, the three of us last week, Pam, Yanni, and I got together last week to talk about what we were gonna talk about today. And um, I took some notes on my phone, but um, one of the notes is Taoism equals formlessness. And I think where we ended up with our conversation last week was that um, a lot of the kind of like things that are considered breakthroughs in uh, Western art are actually just when some a, a Westerner realized something that um, Asian cultures already believe, mm. right? So like um, the, the um, I have, so, so, some, so where does abstraction come from? Um, that's an answer that we could discuss and um, kind of like it's a, and contest different answers like abstraction. I remember going to the Met um, when I was in my twenties and looking at um, a, a show of ancient Chinese vessels and um, Sumi ink writing. And it was kind of about like the drunk poet scholars of like a thousand years ago in China who were like writing um, uh, their poems, but just like the kind of gesture and energy of their line. I mean, that it, for me, I was like, take that Jackson Pollock, mm -hmm. you know? So I think when we make our work, we're pulling from a, like a, a rich array of of um, historical references that are beyond any Western canon, and and our experience is beyond that as well. So in that way, I think we're really enlarging yeah. um, that the world of abstraction. 
that's a really good reminder, Anna, because we had talked about just kind of the non-Western um, inspirations in a sense. And I think, you know, I mean, for me, the abstraction, you know, we had talked about Taoism, the formlessness in a sense, and it really hits it to the heart of abstraction. So I think, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I guess from a person of, you know, Vietnamese American, my experience, it, I, my inspiration does come from that. One of the reference, big reference is the Taoism and the meditation practices of, you know, Buddhism and so forth. Yeah. Which um, is completely atheistic and non, non Abrahamic, you know, it's yeah. just, just sitting and it's just relating to the silence and the boredom. So I had a question about that actually, um, because we did talk about that and, and, um, you know, um, you mentioned um, this kind of meditation or meditative practice. Um, it, and and it re in relation to um, abstraction and um, where this, this, this meditative uh, state of selflessness where your ego isn't um the, the the thing that's guiding you and 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 i think this um one of the listeners or um question of progression is you know in some ways it's a very western uh way of thinking about really? things right uh, uh so um and I don't know what to say about that, actually. Um, but and um, and there, are, you know, the work is always kind of complex, and there are many different ways of, yeah, you know, um, looking at it, thinking about it, and and uh, even experiencing it. I mean, if you live with the work of art, which I'm sure we all do, you know how it becomes part of your. Um, it becomes like part of your space, but also like it starts to take on a presence in within your, you know, uh, house or wherever, you know, and and um, and and it, you know, you have different experiences, uh, and and it's it's an it's kind of an ongoing relationship. So um, so I guess um, as a practice um, of some kind. You know, it's it's a constant um, sort of maneuvering of where you are uh, in relationship to your decisions, and this idea of selflessness um, is a certain kind of state. But bringing it around to you, um, uh, some is you know, there's so much physicality actually in your work. I find from the smallest objects of your vases and small ceramics to large wall bound things. And um, maybe you can, uh, if we have time, um, you know, maybe expand on that in relationship to the, the physicality uh, of your uh, making. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I guess I've always sort of just sort of genetically, in a sense, you know, in art school, I've always made through sort of three-dimensional wall works in a sense, you know, from uh, being inspired by Schwitter and, you know, Rauschenberg, just what they <clears throat> could do with just the sculptural surface of the painting. And if you look back, for example, you know, just looking at Titian, late Titians, and just mm -hmm. the thickness of the oil paint and just the the surface, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the oil emerging as a form. Um, so I, I guess for me, I just, it just makes me feel connected. You know, I mean, I admire what you do because it's like just in many ways, it's just, you know, except those glass pieces, there's obviously a structural quality and the weight, how much the paint is raised, right? Mm -hmm. But like in the in your canvases, it's totally purely flat. And I think when I think about myself, I don't think of myself. I think of myself foremost as a painter. I don't think of myself. I'm making ceramics now, but it's all about painting in a sense. Mm -hmm. When I make my vases, it's about a painting being wrapped around a globe, a, a vessel. So it's purely coming from a painting, you know, point of view. It's not. 
I'm using ceramics as because I feel comfortable and I, but it's really about the source. I think of myself as a painter. So mm -hmm. I guess just the, the, the texturality of my work has a lot to do with the components of materials of, and I think it has something to do with my experience as I used to be a private chef. I've cooked since I was a kid. I've incorporated food elements. I think Anna, we were talking about, cause we had shared a studio and you would see like, I would incorporate beet, I would cut the beet in the kitchen at the woman's building. And then you would see the leaves in the kitchen, you know, later on. So I think there was a part of me that I wanted to incorporate a certain kind of what I do in life, you know, my, and my love for just working with food is very similar into, for example, making glazes for the ceramics. There is an alchemical component and a challenge to uh, sort of simplify in a sense, sort of like learn, you know, because for example, when you cook or when a young artist makes something, they want, they add a lot. When you cook, you want to, you think more spices, more, you know, and, or when you start out, you, you want to like, there's a tightness and you want to make it real realistic. And so, so that, is a compulsion to add more to something. So I think, um, you know, as you know, we all, you know, mature in our practice, in a sense, there is less is more in a way, right? And allowing the material to speak itself, allowing the ingredients of like the salad or the celery, that in itself has a flavor. You don't need to necessarily, you know, add another spice. You could just add salt to sort of accentuate the, you know, the distinctiveness of a celery, for example. So I guess for me, making paintings is a very similar process to cooking in a sense. It's just sort of like a chemical quality, that, that textural quality of a painting rising to the surface. It really, I mean, it just allows me just to directly engage with the painting. Otherwise, I don't, I mean, in a way, I don't have sort of like the, courage to make like some of your paintings like just just relying solely on just the flatness to create a sense of depth and you know um so yeah i don't know if that explains I have, I have a question um that i wanted to respond to thank you for that um um and this is actually for anna and uni um since you both teach um, you responded to that question, especially the part um, about <clears throat> your work, either of your works, furthering the progression of abstraction. And you said it's a very Western way of thinking. And I'm curious, since the two of you teach, have you um, taken a non-Western approach to sharing, translating, interpreting um, I, um, art ideas and or just your approach to teaching? Um, thanks, Lisa. That's a, that's a, that's a very timely question because <laughs> institutions across the country and across the globe are being questioned, yes. you know, in a very serious way about how, you know, they use and abuse power. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, um, it's also interesting because if I, if I have a class full of undergrads and I ask everybody to raise their hand, if they know who Rauschenberg is, um, I don't always get a lot of hands. So I think that it's, that's good and bad. I mean, it's good because then there, the idea of Canon is kind of like maybe disappearing a little bit. Um, and so when I, when I, I teach studio classes to my undergrads, but um, I can introduce artists that are international um, when I'm trying to explore a certain theme. And, um, and that's actually the kind of the mandate of the institution that I'm at anyways. Um, yeah. Um... Teaching is um, teaching art is um, both um, incredibly rewarding, uh, but also really difficult at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, and um, you know, um, as as I get older and students get younger, <laughs> you know, and um, 
I think, um, I think, I think what I try to do is to to um, to introduce as as much or as many as um, other artists what's happened in history, and to just to expose them um, as much as I can. I think in this country, um, there's a kind of, you know, um, you know, there's a deficit in terms of, of our cultural, um, you know, uh, knowledge or experience, um, you know, at a university level. I mean, in, in, and maybe Anna, um, or uh, 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 Don will agree, but or or not, but um, you know the students that come into uh, art programs at uh, an, an art school, or as opposed to let's say a university, a larger uh, you know research university, is um, I, I find them dif different from one another. Um, and there's, it's great that the um, students are uh, interested, um, but they're also, I, I find sometimes what I am having to do is to also kind of introduce what, to introduce them, simply to introduce them and to, 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 to actually see work, artwork in person. Um, students are not always, um, used to doing that. I mean, I didn't really do that a lot myself. Um, and at some point you become interested in the subject enough that you are motivated and um, to, to, to go see the work in person. But I'm always telling my students to do that, of course, whenever they have the opportunity, because it's so much learning also comes from actually seeing things in person, sure. um, you know. As you know, um, so um, yeah, I mean, I think teaching for me has been really um, important and integral to my um, own changes and, and evolution um, as as an artist. So it's uh, it's an important part of my life. Okay, well, are there any final questions that you all might have for each other? If not, I do have one last question for each of you. <laughs> One last question, and it is, and you know, I started early on asking this question during the series, and it's just, <clears throat> I, I, I forgot, but I'm glad that I remembered with you all. If each of you had to choose an element of art to represent you, line, shape, color, texture, and so forth, what would that be and why? <laughs> Well, I can go. <laughs> you choose color, Annie. <laughs> you choose color. What would that be and why? Um, well, I, I don't know, color, I guess, um, <laughs> because um, I don't know why. Um, I, I, I find that there's so much to, there's so much, um, there's so much more than what I think I know. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, um, so yeah, I, I would say that. Tom? You're talking about if I had to describe myself in the form of, you know, art related oh. material? As an element of art, it could be line, shape, color, texture. Oh. What would you be? Well, I mean, the what the thing that you? pops out the most is like if you just took a piece of clay and you smear it on a piece of white paper. I guess that's <laughs> what I'm thinking of my, myself as, in a sense, because it's a, uh, in a sense, when you if you took a piece of clay, right, and then you just make a mark on a piece, just one gesture, it's kind of like a figure of an eye. It's sort of like, it's a it's a calligraphic mark in a sense, mm. right? So it's not using ink, but using clay. So there's I get that there's gradations of like how much you know thickness of clay and so forth so right. I guess I think because I've been think I think about clay and I guess in a sense that 
one, that letter of the of the the I or the L, I guess that would be a representation of where who I am. Because also the clay in a sense has organism in a sense, right? It's a live material. So I guess I when you ask that question, so yeah, I'm just like, you know, the express the just the quick kind of graphic gesture of like a clay mark in a sense on a piece of paper, white paper. Okay. Anna? Um, first thing that popped into my head was weight. Uh, cause I want to impose my weight on everyone else. And, um, <laughs> because gravity is inexorable or maybe we can escape it. Maybe we can escape it and be free. Mm. Mm. Well, That's beautiful, you. Anna. Yes. Thank you. Well, you guys, this has been wonderful earlier in the conversation when we were talking about <clears throat> Look, you guys were talking about Yinny's colorful paintings. You talked about joy. <clears throat> and <clears throat> as I'm thinking of my own life, and you know, as we do, we are very reflective at the end of the year. I had a great conversation with my mother's husband, and uh, we talked about pursuing joy. And that's my commitment to myself. So my, my wish for you all and everyone who's watching is that may you be filled with joy and pursue joy in 2022, along with great health. And uh, I thank you all for being here. This has really, really been wonderful. Thank you for trusting me with this conversation, Anna and Uni and Thumb. And um, I'm really excited to have you and thank you all. Thank you Lisa. so much, Lisa. Thank you so much. Just adding thank to you. the joy, I think it's like the, instead of the Omicron, the joy, because, you know, <laughs> right. When we have joy, it really, it just sort of spreads to make everybody around us happy. So, yes. Yes. Thank, thank you, Lisa, so thank, much. And Anna and Yanni. Yeah, it thank was you. Great, to, uh, great to talk to you. Um, it's really been a pleasurable yeah. experience. I feel like we really kind of, we went deep in many ways, you know, and I was actually surprised. It's not <laughs> nicely surprised, you know, <laughs> that it actually went really far. So thank you, you did, for, and, and uh, I appreciate the conversation. You know, there are so many times that there are things I wanted to say with the interject and the conversation was flowing. And then one of you would say what I was thinking or <laughs> use the term. And I was thinking like yeah. tension one time and then you mentioned tension and blah, blah, blah. And then there was something else. I was like, okay, yeah. You know, the conversation is flowing and vibing and I'm just going to sit back and let it ride. And it's been great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. I think the two points that I really highlighted for me, Anna, when you were talking about our conversation about the Western, the non-Western influences in a sense, like we're not necessarily just, you know, thinking about Western art and philosophy, but there is a connection to the Eastern tradition of, you know, selfless, selfless pr the practice of meditation to relate more in the mind and the selflessness and that in itself, the abstraction that's like, you know, that's a that's a kind of inspiration to abstraction. And also, um, Yanni, when you were talking about the question, which is a really valid question about, oh, what is your contribution to abstraction as colored people in a sense, right? And it's an important question because we are, but on the other hand, it's uh, kind of a Western question because it's, uh, you know, being, for example, being gay, like, why do I have to explain that I'm gay? Why do I need to declare that? Straight people don't necessarily have to like, you know, um, talk about their- yeah, the burden is on you to have to- Exactly. This, yeah. right? But yeah. I do think it's an important question because we right. do have to explain it from, because there's a relative aspect to it. So it's important because we need to, it's a generous, you know, to talk about it because our experiences are real and it is, you know, we have, been other we are yeah. other you know um asian viol violence against asian people right. you know violence historically against black people so it is a it is an important relative question but on the other hand it's also we're also complex human beings and ultimately we are just human beings we're artists you know uh and we are you know we we're exploring in a sense. And it's in a sense, in many ways, it's we go beyond our identity, right? Because when we talk about abstraction, we're entering the realm of sort of pos unlimited possibilities, right? Mm 
yeah. uh, and yeah. a selfless quality. So that, so I think both are important to kind of consider, you know, like engage our relative experiences, but also the phenomena of selflessness. And I think that's, I, I really appreciate thinking about this. And Lisa, I really appreciate you, you know, inviting all three of us to talk about this because it's such an important, that abstraction, that selflessness is so important because it's, if you think about it socially, it's just everything is just so um, conflictive, you know, and divisive. And that abstraction to really create, it's really, for me, it's like, it's really about spaciousness. And that spaciousness yeah. is really at the heart of abstraction. It's just non dualistic, non, it's selfless yeah. and it's empath, it's compassionate in a sense. Because yeah. when you don't have the du the division, the duality in a sense, and the self, it's really, it really enters the realm of like, you know, love. Yeah. And I think when you talk about joy, it's really complex because love is very complex idea. Okay. Beauty is complex because it enters, it, it goes into the territory of beauty is, you know, goes into the idea, the, the territory of selflessness and mm -hmm. compassion, just for the pure, you know, existence of the non-dual thinking. That's so, um, I mean, such a, such a, you just, just what you just said, it was like, uh, I'm glad it's recorded because you just encompass so many ideas, but sort of encapsulated it. And I was thinking, you know, uh, of Haraway, Donna Haraway again, about this idea of relationality, and, but deep, relationality where it is hard to, or I would say impossible, and it makes no sense to sort of isolate these ideas and interrogate um, interrogate what, what that means. And you can only do that at, in, in relation to other ideas or other events or other experiences mm -hmm. or other knowledges, you know? So it, it really doesn't, none of these things really work in in isolation, um, you know, exclusively. Right. So, so this idea of connectedness, but in a, you know, to, to really think deeply and to interrogate it in a deep, um, you know, and sometimes difficult to do uh, is um, what, what she talks about. And so I think you just kind of embodied all those, uh, yeah. the concept of that, so um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I thank you, Yanni. I do. I mean, I think we are, you know, we are practitioners and we artists. And I, I mean, for me, for the longest time, I've always, I guess, for me, making art, I think a lot about what, what is beauty, what is love, and I think abstraction really encompasses those two things, and it's not, and the be beauty and love is really complex subject, you know, as yeah. we. I've been talking. It's really it, to enter that sort of selfless space. It's really takes a lot of learning how to relate to boredom. Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's and important. I think, yeah. Yeah. It's so important. it's uh, I you know I I really I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk about abstraction because I think it ultimately leads to to you know to what what is beauty? What is joy? What is you know love?